the human desires are shifting into and sort of intersecting with the desires of machines because I think we've personalized our machines so much that to really differentiate between ourselves and them it's becoming harder and harder. It's more than just having them do work for us. They're, they're really starting to be us. I think that that's one of the sort of areas that the shows do that really is kind of a, a, a social experiment, not just an exercise in mechanics. I wanted to do a show for everybody who ever thought they had too much but uh, still wanted more. This is dedicated to the guilt that they should have felt but never did. Well, there's an abundance of things here, an abundance of pianos, an abundance of machines for such a small space. When you think the walking machine saved me out of the way, you want to try to set whatever's in there boiling. There's food in there, right? You want to cook it. Cook that food. At that point, Brian, you're to come over here and start like getting the stuff on the wall, just be the total brat. Come in like under this thing and like up to the audience. Start freaking around in here, snap a piece of furniture. The machine doesn't move very fast, but you have to remember that it can swing around anywhere. The thing on the end has about eight horsepower on it. It could severely maim you. Anybody running around in there is really going to have to watch out for that.
most people, there's just not much chance that there's really going to be any real peril or danger in their life. I feel like it's kind of nice that you can create a situation where people really get to confront like some really heavy, serious, hazardous things and really get it shoved in their face, but not to the point where it just is a negative thing. When the giant corkscrew machine came over two feet above your head and you said, my God, I could sit here and die, but you didn't die and so it was happy. It's sort of a way of having your cake and eating it too, really. People get that stimulation that's really extreme without the hangover. certainly was the most loudest, most scariest art opening I've ever been to. I thought it was like being disintegrated. The show made me think that um, machines are real dangerous and, and you think that's noisy. I don't know if that eye protection and that ear protection was adequate, but uh, I really got out of there after about 10 seconds, just out of basic survival instinct. This is the first time we've really done anything that's you'd call a real art exhibit in an art space. I mean, the reason that SRL shows haven't been part of this world is this conscious decision on my part that there's something really wrong with that world, and there's a lot of things about it that, you know, I felt really alienated from. There's this very sterile relationship that people have to what they're seeing at a gallery. It's very proscribed, it's very much down the line, like controlled in a way that, I mean, it's even more controlled than the relationship, say, that a big corporation would have with its, with its workers. And, and uh, I mean, it's very, very ordered. And very, almost like, uh, I mean, it's, it's almost as if these are somehow these reverent objects that, uh, you know, we want to keep in this pristine condition and it, we want the relationship between the people there and, and the things they're seeing to just be this pristine thing that never changed. In other words, just like total stasis. And that's why we, we did the show this way. In the first place, you don't have those aesthetic angles. We really played all that stuff down. It's really just deals with that experience and how to make it more intense, how to do things like manipulate the audience, sort of trap them in places, uh, sort of make them uncomfortable, make them really feel like they were in the middle of something that maybe they might not get out of. There's the shockwave cannon, which is a thing that actually interacts physically with you. It also creates like a kind of a vibration, almost sort of a sickening vibration. If, if you're in there for any length of time, you, get, you get inevitably will get a sinus headache 
from just the pulse going up your nose, even with earplugs in. It was so loud it hurt. It hurt my ears. And they pointed the gun at me and they wouldn't they wouldn't stop. And they blew the, the gun blew the mask right off my face. Did you see the performance? No, I didn't. I'm a composer and my ears are really precious to me. And someone also just walked out with a bleeding nose or something, so I'm a little lily livered, what can I say? I had to think if these people are really in control of what they're doing. <laughs> trust the humans? I mean, should, should anybody trust anything completely? I don't think that anybody should trust any, anyone. I don't think that anybody that goes in that exhibit should trust us. I think that I think that you should size us up, and that's what I think people do when they walk in there. From what we can gather, there was some sort of a call of an explosion and that somebody here was hurt, um, which got the ambulance and the fire department to respond and then re-respond. Uh, doesn't appear to be anything other than an art exhibit, and the woman suffering from a nosebleed from what I can see. Uh, do you like this sort of art? Do you think it's art? Yeah. Different, but it's art, I'm sure. One doesn't usually associate art with physical danger. Uh -huh. And to have uh, uh, both an artistic experience and one that is uh, potentially life-threatening is um, almost sort of a, a new uh, high. No, the finger, I like it because it's, it's more like a living thing. I mean, for this, get, this show, it's nice because it's really mechanical, but it's also really organic. It also moves real fast. It, it's very threatening. It's like, uh, it's like it's trying to escape from that thing. It's like, a, like a, you know, a snake when you grab it down low. It, it doesn't just sit there. It tries to get away, and it, it, it's not too particular about which direction it goes. I wanted it to be more than just you walk into here, you look at the machines, and that's that. I wanted to make give give make you feel like you were being manipulated. The audience was being manipulated, so that the perspective had to change. I think, and that's that's one of the things you see when the catwalk goes up and down. And then there's also the the uh, conveyor belt in the middle that jogs back and forth continuously. And then there's the platform, which that leads to. And of course, when the catwalk's going up and down, you can't really move. You're sitting on this platform that this finger is banging on and shaking around. And, and uh, you know, you're looking down there on one side, and you see the scrabbler like struggling around in glass because the finger's been chopping these bottles which have been falling in there. And it's like, Jesus, you know, this thing is sure is shaky. I, w I wonder if it's, I wonder if I'm going to fall down and be like this guy. That's kind of a nice metaphor for being trapped in a, in a good vantage point, like, in a, like being up in a, like a nice tall tree, but with the branches chopped off below you. It's sort of a nice view, but it's, uh, it's the only view you have.
because there's two sensors in there. Or the one that sees you when you go on the catwalk and then the one that sees you when you go on the platform. They turn on the sequences that, that loop together in different ways. And that's, that's kind of nice because it's almost like it's more fair. It's like you don't get a free lunch. You can't just walk out on the catwalk and see the whole show. Someone's got to go on the platform or else the whole sequence doesn't really come to pass. That's, that's kind of nice because it makes people, I think, work a little bit more and it's, it's uh, I don't know really if people understand that, but it's, I, I take a secret pleasure in seeing that when they walk only out on the catwalk, they don't really get to see everything happen maybe the way that they might if they, if they went and went all the way onto the platform and took that maybe little extra chance there. Everyone who's had in contact with machines has sort of been propagandized to think that really they're only these practical servers of our own interests and somehow these practical extensions of our needs, et cetera, et cetera. I think the nice thing about using computers and in, for what we use them is we're taking them and short-circuiting that, that expectation, turning it on its head and saying, look, there's all kinds of weird stuff you can do with computers. You can even use them for this kind of a show. It's important to try to take technology before people just get used to having it around and used to it, you know, before it's established, before there's like a protocol that's like, that just makes its use really uninteresting. people that, that uh, have cellular phones and that have taken the trouble to uh, finance uh, the cellular phone system, those first few pioneers that are, that are gullible enough to think that there's really no way that you could hear what they're saying and that, uh, that they'll just spout off anything just about. And uh, I'd like to thank those people because they're the people that made this soundtrack possible because that's essentially what it is. It's just people saying the most inane things, a collection of the most inane statements that, uh, that, that you could ever imagine hearing. We, we recorded them, picked out the best ones, the most representative ones, and uh, put them together on, on, on loops, uh, tapes that uh, we're playing at the show here. Very, very high volume. I mean, to me, that kind of soundtrack is saying really what these machines are saying. They're all out there like parading themselves around like a bunch of peacocks saying, this is me, this is what I do, this is what I do. And you know, when they bang into each other, it's almost like the dispute over like who's like the best peacock kind of a thing. I think that's how the machines sort of typify human relationships. So much of our art, when it's in the museum or the gallery context, is made sterile. Particularly, the whole sense of art being put behind glass and being untouchable and being made into this commodity, this object, which is inaccessible. Museums do not touch the art, and therefore the art does not touch you or does not move you. And I think a message which is being put forth here is that art can affect you, or we're being reminded that art should affect you. And even if it has to be taken into this blatant sense, it really it comes across very clearly that um, the integral part of our lives, that art can really dig in and get under your skin. It's really just scratching the surface, I think. I wouldn't want to just keep scratching the surface, though. I wouldn't want to take this to, you know, another city and do it, for instance. I'd never do that. It's not what SRL is about. It really, it is a research organization. Once you figure something out, you don't just keep figuring it out because it's then you're a manufacturer. Most research organizations don't exist in the real world. They're part of like a company, you know, that uses their work in a practical sense to sell products or to, to make things, to make money, basically. It's really, I mean, that's one thing that about SRL that I really want to maintain the fact that it's really not part of that world of commodification, that really it's, it's the product really isn't anything you can pin down and like, you know, put in your order at Macy's for every spring and, and be assured that you're going to even get anything. I, and I, I always want to keep it on that level where it's not tied to like having to make a buck, where it's not tied to like, you know, 
reproducibility, which is what the art world's tied to. It's really unfortunate, but, but most of what the art world is geared toward is like figuring out something, solving a problem, and marketing it and selling it over and over and over again. And I mean, if you, if you realize that, when you look at that, it, it really calls into question, like, what are the differences between like the art world and the business world? Ultimately, there is no difference between it. And I, if I wanted to be in the business world, I wouldn't be in this business, that's for sure. I could make a lot more money in another business. And uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I don't think that's going to change here. And if it does, it wouldn't be SRL anymore. I heard George Bush say that every American should try to improve the country. We need a thousand points of light. I just said, oh, obviously that means making one of these things. Each one of those thousand points of light could potentially set a fire to something. Carnival's are sort of fun in sort of a sick way. Carnival is about excess. It's not really so much about fun, it's about too much fun. And I think that that's a little bit what this show is about too. There was a lot of things that were just too much here. We're doing a whole series of events based on low technology man and machine, uh, focusing on artists that make machines. And uh, SRL and Mark Pauline sort of started the genre in a manner of speaking, so uh, it was appropriate that we kick off this series of events with Survival Research Labs. He is just so brutal, that's what I like about it just like simply so brutal. Yeah, I think it's maybe upbeat in a little bit more of a psychotic way. I hope that, that everyone in the audience gets, gets major inhalation of, of diesel and smoke and fumes and, and has images burned into their retinas. I just hope for the best, like always. the carnival of misplaced devotion, one of those uh, desperate kind of rituals where people invoke the higher powers, usually to no good end. We got the sacred cow rising above it all. We have this sort of, you know, this sort of not really burning bush, but this book bush of pestilence. How do you invite a bunch of like uh, indolent, uh, lazy gods into your world you know you sort of make it like hey this is going to be like a big party you all come on down when, it, when the engine's on just like disengage this thing make sure it's disengaged the v1 it was a, a replica of the german uh, buzz bomb engines that they used to bombard England with in World War II. Anything that powerful just seems like it should be illegal on some, in some way, but it's very difficult to regulate because it's, it's such an uh, uh, unfamiliar quantity. It's the first time I tried it, it actually was a, sort of a bird call for the police and the fire department. They came down in about one minute afterwards, and the firemen said that their building which is about a mile and a half away, was shaking so much that the windows were rattling quite fiercely. 
And by that time, 300 people had called in uh, on the earthquake hotline reporting an earthquake that seemed to not stop. They finally just said, well, uh, you can run this again, but you're just going to have to call us first. The second time, we ran it actually down right in the yard. It was a Sunday, and there was probably about 200 people up in this park having you know, some kind of a picnic right next to our house, all these kids and family and stuff. And as soon as it turned on, these people just panicked and ran, ran for their lives. And uh, it was kind of funny because most of the people were pulling their children away from it, and then the kids were running towards it. Yeah, it's Lieutenant Garcia from the fire department. I was supposed to be informed when you were uh, going to make a test on this machine you have there. We're getting several phone calls in the area of something happening there. Uh, in the future, I would suggest that you call prior to uh, testing this machine, or else we'll have to get in touch with proper authorities. We're not doing it anymore in town. We're going to we have a permit up there to run it up there to show. These people ran like flies. It was great to see that. The noise itself was strong enough to make the ground shake. It's loud, but it can't hurt your ears because it's real low, you know. So it's, you can't you can't damage. It's a sine wave too, so it can't damage your ears. There's a lot of vibration in Well, there's some vibration. You can feel it, you know. It's like a bass. It's like bass at a rock concert or something. That's what the people are calling about. We didn't know if there was. The nice things about the low frequency stuff is it's not really impeded by air. They travel very far. Like this V1, you could probably hear it for almost 10 miles away. And it probably shakes buildings for about uh, a mile or two. I guess that's good in a way because it kind of like expands on the SRL thing that you like only irritate people who pay. Because then with this, like you can be irritating everyone, people who even don't pay, right? You know, the unsuspecting customers. Frequencies from uh, 50 to 100 hertz have a pretty consistent kind of effect. It affects the uh, fluid in your brain is the idea because what it's doing is it's alternately compressing you and expanding you however many times a second the pulses are. You get very giddy, your eyeballs shake, and your vision becomes slightly blurred. You feel like there's rats or something crawling around in your chest. It feels really good though. I mean, it's like, it's like uh, a big glass of fresh orange juice every morning. I mean, it's like, there's nothing like it really. And it's, uh, it's very refreshing, I think. It's like good vibration. I made a whistle that was about 160 hertz, and that was really scary. I turned it on, and it was really intense. It was shaking stuff in the shop. And, and then I turned it off, and about a half hour after I turned it off, it was like I took some kind of really bad, bad drug. Every time I touched anything, or I moved and bumped into something, or spoke, I felt like my whole body was shaking. You know, after about 12 hours, I started to get kind of scared. And I talked to other people, and there's real serious danger that those frequencies, you really can rupture capillaries in your, in your uh, body, uh, your brain, you know, brain hemorrhages and stuff like that, uh, especially between that frequency and 500 hertz. Medusa myth, and that's where sort of this notion of the silent scream came from, it was after the Medusa you know, had her head cut off, there was this sound that was like beyond the sound of all sounds, basically the sound of power cut and, and just beheaded, you know, total power beheaded and stopped. They cut her head off and the head grows again. It was a story like this, and then the snakes are still alive. So even being with her head cut off, she can still be alive, as you can see. The crew has been working here you know, minimal 18, 18 hour days to 20 hour days. We brought with us originally 12 and from San Francisco. And then during the week, 
more and more came. So I'd say we have about 20 to 25 people, including the locals, I'd say we're up around 60. Okay, I'm gonna go and run down, some of this is obvious, but the operators, and if they need spotters or any assistance, speak up. You know, we have some people here that are as, as good as you'd find in any laboratory, uh, anywhere. I'm a computer programmer. I do computer graphics. This is different. Instead of moving bits around on the screen, I get to move around large pieces of machinery. This is a, has more, more immediate gratification to it. I normally work up at uh, Stanford University on the linear accelerator. Even at Stanford, we have to build some things that are practical. And uh, building a 13-foot tall Tesla coil is hardly justifiable for the accelerator. As long as I can paint and burn it the day after, I'm, I go for it. For most people who are really skilled, they're just, uh, you know, they're working for a company and, and uh, they're employing their skills, which are a part of them personally and something they take pride in at, at someone else's behest. I think SRL just provides a place where they can feel a little bit better about what they're directing it towards than they would if they were at a job. I mean, we don't really pay people in money here, but I try to make it at least uh, you know, interesting in all the other ways. I left my kids at home, my husband, I scraped up the money to pay for the gas and got a ride with a bunch of people that I didn't know. When we got here at 10 in the morning, we just started working and I'm really satisfied. I'm having a great time.
an epiphany, truly. I mean, there were flames, there were crickets. What can I say? Definitely have the new hairdo tonight with the air cannon. Oh yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was a real carnival. But the most amusing part was the cops that were standing up on the viaduct. They were like ducking behind the, the rocks. And when the flamethrower first started, like they all had their little walkie-talkie things out. And they were like, oh my god, you know, did these guys have a permit to do this? This? You know, so it was pretty amazing. I think we called down a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of some spirit, potential, from somewhere. <laughs> I've read a number of interviews of Mark Pauly, and I think he's kind of a, an evil genius, and better blowing shit like this up than other stuff he could blow up, I guess. I think it worked pretty well. I mean, I think that the people were really scared. I think the people really kind of felt this vibration. It was just like this weird kind of like transparent violence. I mean, they didn't really know what it was. I mean, they were like kind of being hit by air and like shock waves, and you can't really see what it is. Part of the way that a show like this, I think, had to work was if we had lots of like very intense things that were a little bit inexplicable, like the V1 and the Tesla coil and the flamethrowers, because those, those are things that are very intangible. Mere machines are not enough. I mean, it's not enough just to have a huge machine galloping around and picking things up and throwing it around. I mean, there's something about that that's very mortal. The Tesla coil is a high voltage power supply that uh, is capable of throwing electrical discharges about uh, 20 or 30 feet. I wanted to demonstrate that there are more things to electronics than harmless playthings like uh, furry dog radios or Macintosh computers. It's possible for electronic devices to possess a significant kill radius and not necessarily be user friendly. It wouldn't be a good idea to be near the coil regardless of what some people have said about the Tesla energies being harmless. It's nice to see things get out of control once in a while. Yeah. There's all these things going on here that are so different from the other shows, and in a way, the machines are being dwarfed and sort of, they're sort of drowning almost in all this intensity. It's almost like the machines themselves were sort of the representatives of our own clumsy, uh, our own clumsy souls, I guess. You know, always at a loss to really be adequate in the face of those kind of things, you know, of real power and real energy. People somehow feel like uh, survival research laboratories creates an environment for machines that shows a life that they, that they may have. It's, it's, it's about the development of a, of a mechanical life form. Creating a performance is so complex that it can't be completely controlled and unusual random elements take place, which they always do at these shows, give it a lifelike feeling. I mean, we, we really try really hard to make all the shows uh, as different as you can do and still be more or less doing the same thing, still capitalizing on what you've learned from the past uh, without repeating it endlessly. And, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I kind of like feel like each show is sort of just a chapter in a book and uh, we turn the page and then go on to the next thing.